Hello everyone. Sorry I am late. Um it has been a crazy roller coaster the past little bit. So I hope that you guys can hear me okay. I did post in Telegram that I um am live. Um Elia, I hope you're here as well. Um I Apologize for the delay, but it's really good to see you guys again. So I did do a live last week um, with Aaron, and that was my first time back for like three months. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is a little bit sore today. Um, hello, everyone. Greg, Jason, Yvonne, the Magical. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining so i have been gone off youtube and pretty much everything for about three months or so um october 18th i found out that my grandmother was in the hospital um and that turned into a crazy story that i'm going to tell you guys today kind of where i've been what I learned being hospice um, caretaker, the process of grieving um, a loved one that has passed and how we can still connect with them even after they've crossed. I've learned so much in this time and I, I've definitely needed some time away from social media. Um, it's definitely been hard to do much at all. Um, I'm starting to kind of get back in the swing of things. <coughs> But there's been a few other things that have arisen in my world, so I'm just taking it as it comes. So I'll give everyone a second to come in. I know that a few of you are waiting, trying not to cough. It's very, very difficult right now. But it's so good to see you guys again. Um, this feels more like the video where I get to come back and talk to you guys because... Last week, it was so focused on something else, and so I was, like, popping in to say hello, but <laughs> couldn't tell you guys where I've been or, like, what I have been doing. So I kind of wanted to get into that. I hope that everyone that was waiting for me didn't have to pop off, because I am very excited to see all of you. But if you see this on the replay, then hello. I hope you are all having an amazing day so far. <clears throat> just checking the group really quick um so uh Elia or is it Elia let me know um if you are here I know that you specifically wanted to join this live and you had <coughs> a couple questions as well because you are going through a similar experience and I would love to answer any questions that you have if you are here trying to get some oxygen <coughs> in my lungs. So what happens when you're also emotionally grieving, you start to physically um, purge out as well. So I have really been grieving harder than I remember grieving because my grandma, my grandmother has, is the closest person to me that's passed away. She's like my mother in so many ways. Um, and so I think I'm purging uh, emotionally and physically. So we are just gonna go with it. So I'm gonna tell you guys the story of what happened and why I have been gone. So <coughs> I think the last regular video I did was October 16th or something. Um, October 18th, I got a call um, that my grandmother was in the hospital. Now let me say first that um, my grandfather died like a year and a half ago. And that was really, really, really hard for my grandmother. And she didn't want to be here at all. She's, she is, she was super open about talking about how she's ready to pass on, you know? She always talked about it. Um, especially when my grandfather passed away. Um, and my grandmother lived with my oldest brother for, since he was like 16 or something. Um, and I've talked about him before. He's definitely struggling in a few different ways and our relationship is on uh, many different levels as well but he's been totally reliant on my 
grandparents since he was like 16 so when my grandmother passed after my grandpa passed like my brother had no idea what to do and he struggled with you know suicidal thoughts and addiction and you know we've talked about these things on my channel as far as what it's like to s struggle with these different things but um that's one reason why I feel like my grandma was so tired she took care of everybody she's the one that I talked to you guys about who's basically Snow White. She had every single animal you can imagine. She would rescue any single, any animal or anybody that she could find. She would always help everybody. But she did it to the point where she didn't know where to stop. And especially with my brother, it caused her to get really, really tired. She, you know, she started getting behind on finances because everything was in my grandfather's name. And when he passed, like, no one knew how to pay anything. But anyways, me and my grandmother have had a really 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 crazy relationship i'll have to get into it more sometime but the past 10 months um thank you christopher and i'm sorry guys if this is kind of a little bit of a slow start i haven't i haven't been on um social media or done anything really for like three months i've literally been in isolation i have been so sad i have been purging going through different, you know, a few different things with this, and as you can tell, I'm still a little bit, um, it's still raw for me, um, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit slow, me getting into it, um, it's been definitely hard to even show up for myself <laughs> the past, um, while, so I'm doing my, my best, so if it's a little bit slow, I apologize, thanks, Christopher, so, um, basically, before this happened, I didn't see my, I didn't talk to my grandmother for, 10 months and I didn't know why um tried reaching out you know but there and we've always we've always fought to be with each other like if you asked her where she would want to be out of anywhere in the whole entire world she'd always stay with me like we were always we always wanted to be together and we had to fight to be together because of the family dynamic that we have is really rough no one knew each other it was all like a lot of my family only saw each other at funerals that's still kind of the case um, I don't know a ton of my family, but there's been, it's, it's been hard to bring people together, so it's been hard to have, like, a normal relationship with people in my family, including my grandmother, so, but we didn't talk for, like, 10 months, and now I know it's because she was trying to create distance with me, because she was ready to go, and she didn't want to hurt me, and I talked to my friend yesterday on the phone, and she says, she said that like my energy would keep my grandmother on this earth and my grandmother wouldn't be able to let go if her and I were close um at like the end you know um so before this we didn't really talk for 10 months I tried reaching out I tried calling um and I know that she had a shoulder surgery that like at the beginning of the year and they said if you smoke any cigarettes if you continue to smoke cigarettes then you're gonna have a stroke for my grandmother this was a way out because she was like she feels like she's kind of completed her life's purpose um things were definitely really difficult for her in waking life especially uh with my grandfather gone dealing with my brother like and such a strain in the family like no one could it's it was so dramatic i and i i've always been the one to kind of separate myself from um the family in that in that way especially as i'm older um just because it's definitely been hard <laughs> i'll get into that sometime but um my my grandmother just felt alone like she didn't have anyone she thought that people didn't love her of course i love her i we were together all the time when i was little and it's hard growing up because then you start to um the relationships you have with people change and my grandmother's been my everything my entire life so it was hard getting older because I didn't see her as much and I could tell things were getting harder for her um but she saw the she saw it as a way out um you know smoking cigarettes um because they said that she'd have a stroke so that's what she did she smoked probably like three packs of cigarettes in two days i think they said and i got the call on october 18th 
And she's like the most feisty, fiery woman ever. Like she'd basically like try to kidnap me when I was little because, um, again, there's so many, um, there's so many different pieces of drama in the family and people would try to keep people from one another. And so my grandmother wasn't really allowed to see me for a big portion of my life. So she would like, fight to come see me. Cops were called like it was crazy. So she's a very feisty, very fiery woman. And I've really admired her for that. That they called and said that she was in the hospital and that she suffered a massive stroke and that she had a blood clot in her in the side you know in her brain which caused her to be paralyzed on the left side of her body um took me like a day to go see her <coughs> and they told me she's not going to be able to talk she's not going to be able to move she's not going to be able to really know who you are so don't get your hopes up and that was hard because my grandma's always been like, I'm telling you, like this, just the strongest, the strongest personality ever. Um, and I didn't really expect much. It was, it was so hard because my grandma is like my mom. Like she's the only grandmother that I've really ever known. I really don't know a ton of my family because of course I've never known my biological father. Um, and then kind of the dynamic with my other side of the family caused me to not be close to really uh, anyone too much. But my grandmother was someone that has always really been in my life. Um, even if we had to try to fight or sneak our way to see each other, we've always found a way to talk and to see each other. So seeing her in the way that I did was really, really hard at first because as soon as I walked in, it's like, like, going from the last time I've seen her, we were, like, drinking wine. She came over, we were drinking wine. She's, like, the craziest lady. I love her so much. She was just, like, it was just weird going from that to seeing her and her not being able to talk to me or anything. Um, and, again, they said that she wouldn't, she wouldn't um, be able to <coughs> communicate with me and didn't you know, wouldn't be able to know who I was really. But as soon as I walked in, it's like, she looked at me, she smiled, she lifted up her arm, um, and I ran to her. We were just hugging, we were like crying, and the ladies in there were so surprised because they were like, wow, she has not showed that much energy for every, for anybody. She was, she's not supposed to be able to move that much or show that much emotion. It's almost like she was saving her energy for me. And I got her like a stuffed animal dog on the way because she loves animals and I know she probably was missing her dog a lot and she held on to that <coughs> tighter than anything and I just sat there with her for like four hours no she got the blood clot because she smoked three packs of cigarettes in two days and that's what they said was gonna give her a stroke because she had to stop smoking because of her shoulder surgery that she had and when they told her hey you're gonna have a stroke if you continue to smoking she like doubled down on smoking so the smoking caused a blood clot in her brain which caused her to be paralyzed um so she obviously like knew what she was doing um <coughs> And I stayed with her in the hospital for, like, four hours until I, like, had to go. And I thought that that was going to be the last time I was going to see her. It's like, she didn't have to say a word to me. We just looked in each other's eyes and she gave me that look, like, oh, Haley, like, the look that she's always given me, like, and I told her she didn't have to say a word. She didn't try to have, she didn't have to try to say anything. Like, I, I knew what was being said. It was so hard to leave because I really did think that that was the last time that I was going to see her. Um, so once I left, it was really, really hard to leave. Um, but like, I was just like so upset that night. But the next night I get a call from the hospital because they're wanting to take notes of <coughs> The movements that she made and the things that she did because they were like she's she wasn't able to move for anybody she wasn't able to like she barely opened her eyes for people you know she was basically just sleeping for everybody but as soon as I came in it's like she reserved all her energy it's like she was waiting for me and I talked to her telepathically before I went there like I was telling her I'm coming to see you I'm coming to see you it's okay um, and I really believe that she knew that I was coming but the next day I get a call from the hospital and they're taking notes about the crazy stuff that happened because my grandma wasn't supposed to be able to move. <coughs> I 
or comprehend anything. And she totally knew I was there. Like, she knew what I was saying. She was responding to me. It's like a miracle. Like, they were shocked that she was doing that. Um, and then I found out, you know, that she was going to be going on hospice, that she's not going to be going home. Um, and they were trying to figure out a place for her to go. My grandma specifically said that she did not want to go to a resting home. She specifically said that. Um, <coughs> and so I thought it was my duty to make sure that she ended up in a, wherever it was, she ended up safe. Um, and I remember my grandma telling me when I was little, like, oh, you're not going to take care of old grandma when I'm old. And I'm like, I will. Mark my words. I will. Um, but I didn't think I was going to be able to. Um, <laughs> so they were trying to figure out a place for her to go in hospice, whether it's a hospice center, whether it's with a family member. And everyone either didn't want to or couldn't take my grandmother. And it was presented to me. And keep in mind, currently, like, I live in a two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment. Love it. Beautiful. Lots of space for me. Like, and, But I didn't think that I was going to be able to do that because I lived in an apartment. Like, they asked me, like, hey, would you be able, would you be open to hosting hospice for your grandmother? <clears throat> I was so scared. Like, I cannot tell you the anxiety that I went through because I didn't know exactly what hospice entailed I didn't know what responsibilities that meant for me I didn't know I don't know I didn't I didn't even think I was gonna have the room in here like I was so anxious and I was like calling people asking like what I should do like I called Chance like I called um my friend who um who's a hospice nurse and she even told me like it's a huge responsibility I think you might may be taking on more than you can handle and a couple people said that to me but I had this feeling like this was meant for me the reason why no one else was stepping up is because it was up to me to host hospice for her um and keep in mind I just saw my grandmother the day before and they're like okay well can we you know I, I ended up calling the hospital saying you know that I agreed to it but I was so anxious I had no idea what I was getting into and they're like, okay, can we bring your grandmother down today? I was like, I'm going to need at least 24 hours to figure out what I'm doing in the house to, like, prepare mentally. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Someone's at the door. Okay, sorry, someone was just dropping someone, <laughs> something off. Um, yeah, that was Juno. Um, so I ended up calling and agreeing to it, and she ended up coming over the next day. <coughs> um, I was so nervous, but I was so excited to see her. And they brought her, they came first to, like, get the bed set up. And to get all the equipment set up. And I'm sorry if I keep coughing. It literally feels like I can't breathe. Um, I've been going through it. <laughs> um, plus I think the emotional grief that I've been experiencing has been like making it really hard on my lungs. Because we hold a grief in our lungs. Um, and ever since <laughs> I have my grandma here it's been like hard to breathe. So I think I'm just like purging. So bear with me. I know it's probably hard. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Luminous. I appreciate you so much. Um, so they got, th they got all the equipment set up. Someone came over for hospice to, like, let me know, like, what's entailed in hospice. Like, what my responsibilities are. I requested a nurse to come every day, um, for, like, an hour. Usually, in a, a lot of the times in hospice, apparently they, like, will have someone just come, like, on the weekends or... If you need a break and you need to get outside, you know, someone will come over to watch uh, your loved one and make sure they're okay and, you know, give them their medicine or whatever. I just wanted to make sure that I was doing things correctly because I was so scared. I was so nervous and I really didn't think that I was going to be able to 
do hospice. Like, I was so scared. But I had to decide, like, really fast. And I think that I... It was like that. So I had to trust my gut and my instinct and do it, you know? So, um, they met with me. They let me know what my responsibilities were. There was supposed to be a nurse coming every day. They ended up getting the bed set up. And then they brought my grandma over. And... <clears throat> Keep in mind, hello, Eric. So good to see you. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that um, when they brought her over, <laughs> that bear, she was still squeezing it, holding on to it for dear life. They had her on, it wasn't like a wheelchair, it was like a different kind of equipment to help her get up the stairs. Like she, she can't move or walk or anything. They were just kind of backing her up. And I remember opening the door. And as they're bringing her in, I see her and I say, Grandma, you're going to be with me. You're going to be living with me. And the smile on her face, like, we've always wanted to be together. Like, I've almost lived with her before, but I didn't want to be a burden on her. So I ended up just figuring it out. I had to go from, like, place to place and, like, for a while. Um, and it was really rough, but I really didn't want to be a burden on her. So, but we'd have sleepovers all the time when I was little. As an adult, she'd come over here and just, like, drink with me. We'd drink some wine and, like, you know, <laughs> listen to music or whatever. Um, and so it meant a lot to her that she was with me. I could tell. I could tell. And it meant a lot that she... And it's 222 average watch time, which is her number, which has been showing up a lot. 222. I even have a screenshot of <laughs> 222 today when she showed up, when I was literally doing something for her in that exact moment. So when I see 222, I just have to, um, <clears throat> mention it. But I could tell it meant a lot to her, um, to be over here. They taught me how to use the medications, like, I had to learn how to empty, like, a catheter, which is really not that hard. I, for some reason, I was so scared to do all these things. Um, and they said, a lot of the stuff you don't want to do, you can just leave to the nurses. But I wanted to learn everything, because... I didn't want to put off any responsibilities. I knew that this was going to help. Um, it was going to help me feel like I really could take care of her, you know, and I didn't want to just pass off the responsibilities to someone else. So I learned how to change her, how to bathe her, how to change her catheter, how to give her her medicine. I learned, you know, I learned, like, the cues and the symptoms that she may be showing and, like, what those mean, like, what she needs. Um, and I... I was, like, in the room pretty much the whole time. Uh, I didn't even sleep in my bedroom. I slept right next to her. Um, like, I was with her, like, <laughs> so much that she was probably annoyed at me. She just couldn't tell me. Um, and I even told her, <laughs> like, now you gotta let me love and pamper you no matter what. Because she would never let me do that in waking life. She she probably never gotten a massage in her life. Like, she was always taking care of plants or animals or helping someone or trying to, like, sneak people money in their bags. It's like she was always, she, and she did not value herself, though. Like, she didn't love herself, you know. She talked horribly about herself and thought she didn't do anything, but she, she did everything for everybody. And I told her, like, this is your time to relax and let me take care of you. Um, so the first day she got here was, like, I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. I now had, I now went from, like, having a normal living room to having another person, like, living in my living room and all of this equipment and the bed and all the tables and, like, the entire um, living room and kitchen basically became, you know, <laughs> just medicine bags and, like, all these different things, all these things that I got for her or the nurse brought over, um, but I was so happy to have her here because, like, I knew she was safe with me and that's all that I wanted. Like, I was just too, um, I was almost possessive. I wanted to make sure that she was okay and that she was with me. Like, I really, I really felt that I'd be able to give her the best time out of everybody uh, in our family and, you know, especially from the nursing home. So I'm really glad that she was with me. Um, I read her her favorite poems, um... Apparently, even though she couldn't, she couldn't eat, she was able to, like, drink stuff. And they said, like, since she's on hospice, it's all about just making her comfortable. If she liked wine, give her some wine. If she liked Diet Coke, give her some Diet Coke, which those are some of her favorite things. Uh, she always had a Diet Coke or something. She always was drinking wine. So every time she'd come over, I'd go see her. She'd want me to drink with her. 
Um, so I got those for her. I went to the store. I got our favorite kind of wine. Um, and when you can't, when there's a patient that can't really, like, drink, like, liquids, um, because their throat muscles are weaker, you can, they'll give you sponges. Like, when you have, a uh, a stroke, part of your brain isn't working correctly, so it's hard to, like, swallow food and, like, swallow liquid. So they give you, like, these, um, sponges on a stick, pretty much, like, bag, individual bagged ones that you can just put in, like, anything, like, any liquid they like, um, and then just put it in their mouth, and she'll just suck on it, so I gave her wine, we tried lots of different stuff together, I literally created a whole, like, shopping list just for her, got her some lotions, some gowns, like, a new pillow, like, lavender, <coughs> like, tons of dried lavender, um, candles for her, so I could do, like, candle magic for her, um, all of these things, and I gave her spa days, like, I really, it, I really wanted to go above and beyond, and it, it didn't start like this, like, the first few days, I, <coughs> it was hard for me to do anything, I had constant, like, panic throughout, like, almost the whole thing, um, like, anytime I had to cry, I had to leave the room, because I didn't want her to see me crying, and even though she couldn't talk to me, like, when I would leave the room, like, she would, like, open her eyes and look around to, to make sure that I was there with her. So I had to be strong for her, so I really, I tried not to cry around her a lot. Um, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, I had a hard time drinking water, I was having really bad digestive pain because of the anxiety and the stress, it's pretty much what I had <coughs> before that lucid dreaming healed. Remember that story of, like, those digestive issues? Like, they started coming back, like, and I was so sick, like, I couldn't sleep at all throughout the night. I was, I would sleep for a couple hours, just wake up and just be, like, throwing up because I was so anxious, like, and that's, I hold stress and anxiety in my stomach, so when I am going through a really stressful situation, I, like, get physically sick, um, and that, so it was pretty much up until now, so like three months almost of like just trying to like process whatever is trying to like come through me. I know it's like a lot of emotional stuff, but it's turning obviously physical, but that's how I was when she was here, but I had to remain strong. And there was people, I went from like <coughs> just having me, Chance, and Gino in our apartment to having person after person after person come in like there was the nurses and then the CNAs and then the hospice person that like helped me sign all of those papers there was a chaplain that wanted to come see um us and my grandmother there was a caseworker then all of the people that wanted to come visit uh my grandmother and so it went from like being so quiet like nothing happening here to like so much happening and not only People were also getting mad because everyone was calling me. I was getting, like, 30 calls a day, but people were coming in, like, left and right. Like, I had to try to handle Juno, which he goes nuts when there's new people. And then my grandma, if she, like, does anything, I'm, like, trying to make sure that I'm there and, like, present for her. It's, like, the only time I left was, like, for two minutes to go to the bathroom. Like, I, I like, everything else, I was just, I was right next to her the whole time. I started to get back problems because I was, like, bent over the bed, like, the whole time. Because I was, like, I was overbearing. And even the nurses told me, you're doing, like, more than you need to. You're doing everything we've recommended. You're already changing her catheter. Like, you're giving her her medicine. Like, you're, like, I can tell she's really taken care of, but you don't need to, like, strain yourself. And I was, like, I am going to put all of my strength and my energy into this because I get one last chance to care for my grandmother and I want to make it a time that she remembers. Plus, because we haven't talked for, like, ten months, I feel super guilty. Even though, like, she was creating that space with me and not answering my calls, so I wouldn't feel hurt. Of course, I'm going to be hurt regardless, but she wouldn't be able to, like, go if her and I were close. And she knew she wanted to go, which is why um, she had to create space with me. But, um, I literally, like anything that I could do, I was doing. And even on, like, the fourth day, I was still Googling and YouTubing, like, hospice caretaking, what else can I do? Like, I, I did every single thing I could find and everything that I would want. And it started to get hard because she went from having her eyes open, like, 
reaching for me. She would play with my hair. She would touch my face. Um, and you can tell she was trying to talk to me through her eyes. And she was really frustrated that she couldn't, um, that she couldn't talk. You could tell she was really frustrated because she would try to talk. And then eventually she would just like, like sigh and be like, forget it. Like, and so I felt so bad because like, I knew she, there was something she wanted to tell me and she couldn't, um, she was drinking for a while, like, I I got these, like, insured drinks for her so I could put them in her sippy cup and give them to her. And they said, you know, if, if she stops drinking, it's okay. That's the process of, you know, crossing um, and death and dying. And um, it's okay if, don't be scared, you know, if she goes even days without wanting any liquid. But I tried as much as I can because I knew that that was going to help keep her with me longer. You know, if I had something on her stomach. And I wanted her to be comfortable. So for <coughs> the first like four days she was drinking and stuff. I was dancing for her. I was singing. She loves Queen. Um, and she showed me a lot of the music that I know now. So I was, I was singing for her. Watching all of her favorite movies. Massaging her. I even laid in the bed with her, like, obviously when it was, like, earlier in, um, because I wanted, I didn't want her to, like, feel uncomfortable, like, physically, but, like, I wish I would, like, even, like, we got pumpkins to carve for her because we wanted her to feel, like, she got to be involved in the holidays, too, so... Me and Chance went to run to go get some pumpkins so we could carve them. I painted next to her. I was really trying to show her all the things I do because she's always asked about my business. She's always asked about, like, what I'm up to. She's She would watch my YouTube videos and she would tell me, I don't know what lucid dreaming is. I'm trying to figure it out, but I'm just happy to see you. And you're very smart and I love you and I love watching your videos even though I don't know what it's about. Like, like you'd go to her house and there's, like, a collage of me as a as a kid and like growing up all over her wall like all over her house so me and her had and still had like a very very special um relationship that's why i was like as long as we're together i know that's all she cares about i don't have to feel guilty because i can't think of more to do for her you know it's like i know this is more than she would have ever wanted um then she started to decline a little bit um, which was hard. Um, they warned me. They were like, she's gonna, oh yeah, she would get, if you didn't give her her medication on time, um, well, you had to, like, up it constantly. So, like, I started with, like, she had, like, three different, um, medications. There was morphine, lorazepam, and hydroperidol. Still remember them. Those three, there was, like, you gave her two doses at a time. It, and like, at the end, it was, like, up to five doses of each at once. Like, and you had to be monitoring it constantly. Like, every day, the doses would go up. And sometimes, it's, like, she would get confused or anxious, and she'd, like, wake up, and then she would, like, put her feet over the bed and try to stand up. And keep in mind, she was literally paralyzed on the left, like, all of the left. But she would, like, something would overcome her where she'd have so much strength that she'd, like try to like get up and just go in my room like everything's normal she'd try to be talking to me and it was so hard like that was so hard and then to see her just get frustrated and like stop trying and I'm like I'm sorry grandma I know it's hard I know it's hard you know but they also warned me um because she started to make these uh she started to not have her eyes open as much um well before she closed her eyes they were kind of like glossy like she she was looking at me <laughs> the first few days that she was here. She was looking at me. She was smiling. She was touching my hair. She, I would show her things and she'd pick it up and look at them. Um, but then eventually she started to only open her eyes sometimes and they were super glossed over. And I really do believe that she saw my grandpa there. She saw all our animals there. She saw the family there. They were waiting for her. Like you could tell when you were talking to her, she was looking through you and her eyes were super glossy you could tell she was like seeing into another dimension is what it really was she started to sleep a lot more and not eat really 
and I hated that, but I knew that it was part of the process. And the nurses would come over every single day. I would talk to them. I'd ask them questions. I would help them with every single thing. I really wanted to be involved in. They would tell me how she's doing. Of course, they would try to give me an estimated time of how long she has left, only because I, I just wanted to know what the signs were or like how to prepare or like what I needed to do. And literally the whole time they're like, oh, she's looking really good. I can tell she's really, really comfortable. Like you're doing amazing. I wish there were more hospice nurses like you, which made me feel really good that I was doing something right. Um, but then she started to make almost like it was like she was snoring. Like she'd sleep with her mouth slightly open and she would like, um, it sounded like snoring. And I just thought that she was snoring. Um, because she was, like, comfortable, and they told me that when you get close to death, that, um, secretions start to fill up your lungs, and your body starts to shut the organs down, and that's why you stop eating, because now your digestive system is shutting down, everything's kind of shutting down slowly, um, and so is her lungs, and so when you get close to the process of death, um, well, in the process of death, you're going to start hearing some things, like there's something in their lungs, and first it starts off like, like they're snoring, but then I started to hear like phlegm and stuff when she was trying to breathe. And I hated that. It got to the point where they told me, you don't, like, they were, they saw it so differently than I did because they deal with this all the time. They're like, no, you don't need to go above and beyond. She's totally fine. This is what happens. Like, she she doesn't even feel any pain or she's not anxious. She can't feel the secretions in her lungs. Everything's totally fine. They told me, like, however you want to spoil her. Spoiler, if you want to dye your hair pink. <laughs> dye your hair pink. Whatever you want to do. Because, you know, it's and now it's all about making her comfortable because she was going to pass anyway. So they were like just super like just like kind about it and like really gentle and like made me feel like it was okay. Like it was it didn't feel so serious. They made it feel um <coughs> this is just what happens, you know? Like everything's fine. Like and I appreciated having that kind of energy cuz it started to get harder when um the secretions started to get really intense. They gave me this <coughs> um this medicine that can help dry up the secretions in her lungs um and so i was trying to do that for a little bit because she was like coughing and like and it was helping for a little bit but eventually it was so bad that they were like it's just better if you just let her go through her process and not try to prevent anything at this point and there was one night where i felt so horrible because she was up all night she was like coughing she was like wheezing it was like she couldn't breathe it's like she was coughing like oh my god it was so oh my god it was horrible and it was like the whole night and i couldn't i couldn't do anything even when i was in the other room for a sec all i could just felt like she was in pain like um and i and they gave me an emergency number that i could call you know like if anything got too intense, and that was the number I also called when she passed, you know, like, I, I had this number to call if I ran out of medications, like, <laughs> if she was doing something that I didn't understand or I didn't know what to do, like, I had this number that I could call, and I called that when she started, like, really being, you know, intense with the coughing and the wheezing and, like, Oh my god. It was so it was so horrible. Like you had to be there. Like it was just especially when you live in an apartment, there's nowhere you can go. Like my whole life is like in this area in my house and like my whole pla like you know, that's how it was the whole time. There was, and I didn't want to escape, but as far as like the sound she was making, everyone's telling me, "Oh, that's just part of the process. Just go in another room." Like <laughs> No matter what, it was still gonna, I was still gonna hear it, and it was just, it was just hard, that's the only thing, because they said it's a lot more scary for family members than <laughs> for the patient, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's called the death rattle, you might have heard of it, basically, once someone's really close to death, then secretions have, like, 
filled up their lungs completely and it sounds like when they're breathing it's like air bubbles are you know you can hear air bubbles and like they're hardly getting air and it just it sounds like you're gargling water or mouthwash it's like that intense it, but constantly like when they're breathing it's just like that the whole time like they're gargling mouthwash for like as long as it takes sometimes that's like one of the last steps before they pass because that's usually what causes them to pass is the lack of the oxygen because of the secretions that fill up their lungs um and that's what the storing start started as but then it progressed into like full on like and it was so <coughs> It was so intense. I remember waking up, um, thank you, Justin. I appreciate you. It was really important to me, and I knew this is a chance to have a sleepover with my grandma again. Um, this is actually her sweater, um, and this is a urn necklace I got for her ashes. It's a sunflower, and it opens up and says, you are my sunshine on it, um, which is what she used to sing to me all the time. Um, but anyway yeah um i'm glad too that she didn't have to be in a nursing home that meant so much to me the last night and i'm telling you guys i was like sick the whole time everyone was telling me you need to eat you need to drink water like someone poured me a glass of water at, in the morning and it would still be back practically full at the end of the day when i get stressed and when i get anxious and nervous like when i'm dealing with something really stressful i can't eat i can't sleep i can't drink very easily which is not good I'm working on that but it's like my when I'm anxious my stomach feels so full that I feel like I can't drink water like I feel like I'm just gonna like throw it up or something um and so people really had to try to like force feed me um because I was just like depleted like there was bags under my eyes I didn't wash my hair for days like I just had it up in a bun I was just wearing a robe like <sighs> um and I knew like I have the energy in here to give all that I can for my grandmother even though people are telling me oh take care of yourself like you don't need to do I just had a feeling to push I just had a feeling to keep going I'll be fine I'm not gonna die I'll be fine but I need to keep pushing and I need to I I feel like it's what I should do and everyone told me oh you need a break I didn't want to break like I wanted to be with her as much as possible um the last day I knew it was the last day for sure it was Pretty much the night after, I'm pretty sure it's the night after all of the coughing and intense feeling <clears throat> she was having, I woke up from like, I don't know, I didn't sleep that well that night, I woke up very early, but you could go into my living room and you could cut the air with a knife. It was so intense. I knew that there was everyone here. My grandfather was here. All of my grandma's pets that she's ever had, which were probably like millions, I'm not even kidding, like, even when I was little, she had 60 pets. Um, 60 animals that were just every animal you could think of, like, um, but her family, I knew her parents, she really missed her dad a lot. She talked about her dad a lot, um, and I could feel they were all there waiting for her, like, I'm not even kidding, like, above her bed, like, and when she would breathe, she had her mouth open. It literally looked like there was, like, you could see all this energy around her. Like, oh, my. And I knew. I told Chance. I was like, today is the day. Today is it. I just feel it. I just feel it. There's so many people here. Like, it's for sure the day. And it was only eight days. Like, I was a hospice caretaker for eight days. But before... She passed, like, um, my parents brought her dog to come to see her, which was really hard. I started crying because her dog was, like, she had this, like, little white poodle snout. I don't know exactly what kind of dog. He's so sweet. His name's Harley. Um, no, he wasn't a poodle. <laughs> he had, like, long kind of hair. Um, but he was just crying and... No, he was a poodle. Okay, sorry, I'm getting her dog mixed up with Max, which was another. There's so many animals, okay? Um, but it was hard because he, like, laid on her and she couldn't react. She couldn't really 
you know, so it was really hard. And during me host, like during my time in hospice, keep in mind, we're also trying to sell the house. We're trying to also find her animals a home. I'm also trying to deal with the caseworker and the mortuary and get the cremation set up and plan the service. And a lot of this was up to me, specifically the cremation uh, and the service, everything regarding that. I did help kind of gather some things, clean out her house. So there was so much I was dealing with while I was hosting hospice and I had to deal with really toxic family members and it was just like so much like I was like oh my god I love my grandma being here um with me I just can't wait until all these other people just like leave me alone because there's like too much but that night the night that I knew she was gonna pass I didn't know when but I didn't I was sitting next to her. I just got some food. That was like the first night I was able to eat. I got some food. Me and Chance were sitting on the couch next to her and I, I remember it was so hard to be there because I just felt like she was suffering like when she would breathe. Like it was like it was like suds and popping and gurgling and bubbling and like it was so intense and I hated seeing her that way and I felt like she couldn't breathe and like at this point she was barely breathing like so I I was like I feel like it's almost happening but what was weird is she would get like apnea so like that which is what happens when you get close to death like you start kind of breathing but then you take long pauses and stop breathing for like 10 12 seconds at a time 30 seconds at a time so she was doing that and I was hearing when her breathing would stop because I was right next to her but as I was talking to Chance just telling him how much uh my grandma means to me and how much I love her I forgot the last time that I heard her inhale so I said it's been a while since I've heard her and so I immediately got up and I could still feel her heart and I could barely breathe her, see her breathing. And I told Chance, it's happening now. It's happening now. I grabbed her hand and I asked him if there's anything he wanted to say to her. And my grandma always told me like, I'll be around. Like, of course I'll be with you when I'm dead. Like, and she was so comfortable with the thought of death because she was excited, honestly. She felt so alone in waking life and she isolated herself and she just wanted to be with my grandpa and her parents and all her animals, like, it made me sad that she had, she felt that way, um, but it made me feel a little better knowing it's what she really wanted, you know, but as she's passing, like, literally, I see her breath, like, it is the last breath she's taking, I just have my hand on her, and I, like, feel her heart is still going, so hard, guys, hardest thing, ever especially when it's someone who's literally like your mom very hard um and she always told me like of course i'll be with you and i've always thought i'm gonna have to set some boundaries with her spirit because she's gonna be like overwhelming she's gonna be so strong i'm gonna have to like set some ground rules but when she she like stopped breathing and i felt kind of her last breath and I started to panic. I started to, like, look around. And I started to be like, where are you? Where are you, Grandma? I don't feel you. Why can't I see you? Because I just expected her to be like, here I am or something. I don't know what I expected. I just expected to, like, know she was there, like, right after. And I freaked out when I couldn't feel her. And so I just started, like, crying. I just, like, burst into tears crying. And I told Chance, why can't I feel her? Why can't I feel her? Um, and he's like, you know how busy she probably is? Like, she has to meet up with all of her animals, her husband, like, her parents. Like, give her some time. She's gonna, she's gonna show up. And I was just like, oh my god, so upset. I, I just held her hand and I stayed with her as long as I could. Um, I called the family to let them know that she passed, you know. Um, she passed at 8.50 p.m. on October 28th. Um, and the mo I had to wait for the mortuary and it was going to take them like over an hour to get to me. So I just spent the time with my grandma, like laying in the bed with her after she passed, like just holding on to her. Um, and I waited until the mortician got here. Um, 
and got her. I helped change her into something more comfortable first. Um, and then what was really crazy is like, she really didn't waste any time to let me know that she was around. Like, as soon as I, as soon as the mortician came and got her, I started seeing auras of like dogs and cats and like she would always have birds on her shoulder. Like, um, let me see. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you what she looks like. That's my grandma. She always had, like, a cat in her hand, like, a bird on her shoulder, a dog, like, and if she didn't have an animal, she probably had a food bowl taking it to an animal. Um, this is her, too. See, she was, she was always with animals, and so when she passed, that was her bird bonita. He could actually say my name. He'd be like, hey, D, and he would dance to Queen. Specifically, Another One Bites the Dust was his favorite song. Um, but that's my grandma. Um, and I started seeing animals immediately. She showed up in, like, her poofy hair when she was younger. And Chance, he does not see auras. He doesn't see anything like that. And we were in his room, like, a couple hours after she passed. And he was like, whoa! I just saw an orb, like, fly next to you. Like, this big sparkle just shoot. And he has never, ever said anything like that. Ever. And then we started seeing, like, tons of sparkles, orbs. I started to smell her. She always would, like, run her hand uh, or run her fingers on my hand or, like, my face when I was little. And that's how I'd fall asleep every single night. She would just, like, rub on, like, my arms and now I have to do this to myself when I have insomnia. I have to, like, rub, like, run my finger on my skin to help me sleep. And I felt that. I felt someone doing that with my hair and on my face. And I knew for sure that that was her. Because even when I visited her at this hospital, she wasn't supposed to be able to move. She had my hand and she just closed her eyes and she was doing what she used to do when I was little. And I started to feel that after she passed, I started to feel her touching my hair, hugging me, kissing me. I felt, I felt her in everything, everything that I did, everything that I looked at. It's like, she's in everything and she's still in everything. And like all these numbers are popping up and her last name's Anderson. And I've been seeing Anderson, 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 Anderson everywhere. It's just like crazy um and I'm really glad that I got to be there because like even though we we didn't feel like we could always be together I feel like a lot of that was made up at the end because we got to have our longest sleepover that we've ever had and I got to prove to her that I do love her you know because I didn't want her to ever question that and I think that's why she held on so long she literally um, was alive like 10 days after her stroke. Um, I truly believe that that was because she was with me. I did sound healings on her. I bought her some stones so I could do some like magic for her. And like I called in her ancestors and her guides and like um, really really just made it as peaceful as I could. I'm telling you, every single thing was monitored. There was always music playing. Like, I had a lot of jazz on. Like, candles were lit. Like, it was beautiful throughout the whole thing. And I, and I think that's something that I'm grateful for, is I got to make it special. I got to make it beautiful. I got to make it fun. I got to help hold her hand and initiate her into where she was supposed to go. And I... I have a notebook, actually, um, that I made for her, and I'm writing our story, pretty much, of, like, the hospice experience in there. I have this section called Heavenly Hugs, which is all of the ways that she's gotten in touch with me, um, and let me know that she's around. <coughs> and then I also have a section in here where I just write what I'm grateful for, you know, with my grandma and, like, what she's taught me, so I have this whole notebook for her and I just wanted to share some of the uh 
the stuff that I've experienced, like heavenly hugs, um, as far as ways that she's connected with me. And I think this would be a good idea to do if there's anyone that's past that you you just want to keep their energy alive. I love to write about her. Um, and every time I experience a sign or something, I get to write it in here. And I'll have to show you guys, now that you know what she looks like, I'll have to show you guys some of the spirit photos I've gotten of her because I've gotten spirit photos of her. I also did a ghost box session with her and her voice actually came through. It was the first voice that came through and all this is recorded. So I'll definitely have to show you guys some more of this stuff. But here's some of the heavenly hugs or um, the signs that she has shown me that she's around. Green, uh, green orb in Chance's room. That was the night she passed. Green, it's like an emerald green is like her favorite. Um, I don't know if it's her favorite color, but she literally had everything in green. Even her sweater that I'm wearing is like that emerald color. Um, so when I see green, I know that it's her. Uh, green orb in Chance's room, an aura of my grandma in Chance's room, an aura of a dog in my bathroom, sparkles everywhere. I got a spirit photo of my grandma, number one. Number two, I just started like um, noting how many <coughs> I got. Number synchronicities constantly. Grasshoppers everywhere. So I have like this weird fear of grasshoppers because my brother, my older brother, um, the ones I've told you about, or the one I told you about, used to like torture me and chase me with them. So grasshoppers were super scary to me. And my grandmother was also scared of grasshoppers. Um, and so after she passed, I've been seeing more grasshoppers. And I feel like that's her coming through for me. And that's a way that we bonded was through that trauma of grasshoppers. But now it's like she's helping me rewire that. Because now when I see one, I get curious. And I know that it's her. And it's comforting. So it's, she's also helping me get over my fears, which is really cool. I'll see butterflies, birds. Birds are definitely a sign of her, um, and really any animal. Smiley faces on furniture and walls, which is constantly hearts on furniture and walls. I'll have to make a video of all of the things. Um, I've been taking pictures of all of these different things that she sent me. Like, I was even crying yesterday over her, like, blowing my eyes out because it, like, hit me really hard again. And the, the teardrop was in the shape of a heart. And I took a picture of it because I was like, what the heck? So, literally, she has found so many ways to comfort me. Um, hearts in the clouds, random or, uh, objects. I'll see auras of her. I'll smell her. She has a very specific perfume. I actually have her perfume bottle from her house. Um, and I'll just smell that sometimes randomly. Um, I'll feel her play with my hair. I'll see the last name Anderson everywhere. I'll feel fingers running on my skin. Um, she'll send me hearts, smileys, and sparkles when I cry. Random delivery of sunflowers and roses, which were her favorite flowers, and some random person delivered those to my house. And those are her favorite flowers, so I thought that was weird. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, Grandma moved the fort sheet several times. So, pretty much, we always, with my grandma, we used to always push the couches together and we'd create, like, forts and stuff. So the couches would pretty much become, like, a bed. And that was something we always did. And my grandpa would tell us, oh, stop moving the couches. And she's like, oh, shut up, Lon. Like, <laughs> my grandpa's name is Lon. But it was just so funny. We would always do whatever we wanted. Um, and so I've been making forts out of my couches. I've been pushing them together and I put um, a sheet over the top of it. And it was, like, moving and bouncing when I asked if she would, uh, let me see if I can show you. I asked if she would come lay with me in the fort and then I smelt her and then I felt and then I saw the sheet start to bounce and then I tried to bounce it too but it was kind of hard because I, of how I like pinned it. But I did get a spirit photo of her um, in the fort with me and I want to see if I can show you guys. I have so many pic- I have- <laughs> I've gotten so many um, spirit photos and stuff since. I'm trying to find it. Um, okay. So let me see. Okay. So this is her. Keep in mind, this is her. Right? And then I asked her to show up. Oh, it doesn't really show you. Do you see her face? Let me show you the original picture. Can you see it? 
<laughs> it's not really working. Um, I'm trying to show you it not circled so you guys could see it yourself. But pretty much, it's it's my sheet, my blanket in the fort, and there is you know the texture of like the fuzzy blankets where if you move it, one side is darker and you can like draw on it kind of if that makes sense. I got a picture. So you could see her face. I don't know if you see like her eye, her nose, her mouth, like her hair, her short hair, but pretty much she came through on the blanket. Um, I wish it would show better. I'll have to um, create a video so you can kind of see it, but I'll have to create a video of all like the pictures and stuff of her that have came through. But, um, it really showed me how precious the process of death and dying is, and it was amazing to be able to hold her hand through that experience, and now it's like we're closer than ever because now we get to be together all the time, and I told her I'm so glad I get to be with you all the time now, and there's nothing or no one that could keep us from each other now, you know? Um, and even still, she shows up every day in some way. Um, I have her ashes here now. I created a whole area in my bookshelf just for her. I was able to go to her house and get a lot of her clothing, a lot of her pictures, a lot of her things. And so I even have a lock of her hair from when she was here in hospice. So I'm just surrounded by all her, her stuff. Um, and that makes me feel good. Um, I even got a big treasure chest that I haven't known what to do with forever but I decided to make it like a time capsule of all her stuff. So I put her blankets in there really nice. I sprayed it with her perfume and then stuff from hospice. Like I still have her gown, her socks. Like um, I have a, like all the medicines that I gave her, um, like everything. And I Maybe it's just the sentimental part of my brain, but I want to remember these things and kind of make, not like a time capsule where I'm going to close it off and lock it forever, but anytime I just need to feel her around, I just open up the treasure chest and it's like all her stuff and it smells like her and it's like, you know, and that's what's given me a little bit of peace through this is like, even this morning I had a dream where we were having a cup of tea together. I remember I was showing her one of my favorite types of tea, which apparently was like this black chai tea with like floral notes or something. I specifically wrote that down in my dream journal, but I remember, and she never really liked tea, but I remember in my dream, she tried it. She's like, mmm, this is good. And that's all I remember is us having tea together. So she'll still show up in my dreams. I'll smell her. Like she'll put our song on. Um... And I just, I just feel her. And she's really helped me heighten my intuition, too. Because um, now it's like, I can see her clearly, like, right in front of me. Like, I've always seen static. I don't know if you guys, um, if that's normal for everyone else. But literally all the time, all around, it's, like, static. Um, and I see pictures and moving images in the energy. Sometimes I'll see, like, auras of actual figures of, like, people or objects. Um, and it's like constant, even when I'm outside looking at the sky. Um, but she's helped manipulate that in a way where I can physically see her a lot. Um, and I haven't had an out-of-body experience yet, but I'm going to, and I'm going to keep you guys updated on it as well. Um, so I'm really excited, um, to keep you guys updated on my dreaming experiences and astral experiences because I am getting back in, but... I just had her service um, the end of last month, and that was kind of like a good amount of closure for me. Definitely hard, and I it, grief is really a roller coaster, but I think it helped me being there um, as she crossed and being able to take care of her, because um, I it really helped me heal a lot of childhood wounds, actually, because I always felt, I don't know, it was like this weird, weird thing where... She didn't feel like I loved her or anyone in the family loved her. I felt the same way. I guess just the dynamic of the family made us all feel that way. Um, and I think that her and I were able to do a lot of healing while she was here. Um, and I made it really, really fun. And even though it was so exhausting and taxing on me physically and emotionally and mentally, I pushed through it. Um, 
And if I didn't feel like eating or drinking, I just didn't. Like, I didn't try to force myself. I just knew that I had the strength to get through this because it was like all of my adrenaline got activated for her. And I was going to do whatever I can to make sure that she was okay and that she was happy and that I did every single thing that I could so that there would be no room for regrets once it was over. And it's interesting because I did all that I could, but there's still regrets after. Um, and it's not really regrets. It's just like, is there anything else I could have done? Or, oh, maybe I should have tried this or this. But it's like, I really did more than I thought that I could have ever. And I told myself, if I can get through doing, like, being a hospice caregiver, I can get through anything and I'll never question myself again. And so that's kind of my reminder when things are difficult. It's like, do you realize what you did during hospice? And you thought that you would never be able to do that. And you thought that was the hardest thing. And you, you you killed it. Like, I have to remind myself that I did do a good job. My grandma is very proud of me, and I should be proud of myself, too, because I did a job that no one else wanted to step up to do. Um, and I also was the only one in an apartment. <laughs> so I really, I really wanted to prove to myself that I, that I could do it and, uh, prove to my grandma that I was there for her till the very end. And I'm, we still spend, <laughs> tons of time together. I'll have to get into it. I feel like she's more here than anything. Like, I'm not even kidding. Um, I'll feel her when I'm sitting down on the couch and I'll just put my hand out so she can hold my hand. Sometimes I will air, like, I'll, I'll, I'll just dance with the air and I'll invite her to come dance with me. Um, uh, when I drink wine, sometimes I'll get her favorite wine and I'll pour her a glass as well. I just really <laughs> include her in everything that I do. Um, and it feels good to know that she's with me all the time. Um, and I really believe that she's my guardian angel, which is incredible. Guys, this is like my mom. Like, I love her so much, and I'm very glad that I was able to do this for her. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing, Justin, for sure. Do you have an ancestor altar spirit has emphasized to me the importance of having one to help your ancestors in the spirit world one of the main practices is burning ancestor money so they have oh currents okay that's interesting so i don't have a specific uh, altar for my ancestors which would be a good idea but i do have a dreaming altar um which does have different pieces of ancestral um kind of work on there um i would love to make a separate one specifically for my ancestors i have so many different altars i want to make i'm gonna have to figure out how to uh how to fit all that in, in my space because i'll have to give you guys a, a tour of my place sometime um by the way the videos will be coming back as well um youtube has been a little bit difficult um and i will probably get more into that when things are completely fixed um <laughs> but let's just say I'm really learning. There must be a lot of lessons that I need to learn or a lot of leveling up I need to do. Um, and this has really taught me about faith and presence. So I'm just, I'm just kind of going with it. But, um, I'll never forget when my grandmother passed away, she practically raised me. She held my hand and gave me a smile and wink on the way out. I swear she's the one looking out for me through all this. Wow, Justin, that is crazy what an incredible farewell that she was able to give you that that energy you know like my that's one thing that obviously I don't want to change anything that happened but like my grandma is so feisty and fiery like I wonder what she would have said to me um if she could but we sure we sure talk a lot now Wow, Justin. I'm just going back and reading the messages, so I'm sorry for the delay. Affiliate like afterlife. After the life saving emergency brain surgery nearly killed me in bed. Wow. Yeah, I've actually had a near death experience too. I haven't really talked about it too much, but I did have an overdose when I was 18. Um and I had a stroke. Um and I actually died for I think they said like 45 minutes or an hour or something um and I did have an actual like near death kind of like out of body experience but it felt like a dream but I saw everything that was happening but they had to like 
hook my heart up to some monitor because it wasn't beating on its own. So it was like sending electric pulses into my heart or something. Um, and that was like one of the scariest moments of my life. And I've never felt more alone than that moment. No one, no one knew that I was there. No one came to visit me the whole time. And when I woke up, I was all alone in this dark hospital. There was no one there. It felt like a video game or like a movie. It was terrifying. Um, but you guys just talking about that definitely brings me back to that because my life for sure flashed before my eyes and I for sure didn't think I was going to make it. So um, it's interesting what these experiences kind of do to shape us though. Um, because it was amazing to be that close with death, like not only for me, but also with my grandmother because it's taught me so much. I feel like we have this stigma of death, you know, and I realized it is such a beautiful thing. It really is. Um, so mysterious and so misunderstood and that's that's one thing I'm going to dedicate more time to um, is really practicing my out-of-body experience work and working on visiting her and reporting back to you guys on what my experiences are and just know that you're going to be um, present for a lot more like raw and vulnerable content not only that but like really my personal practice practices there won't be as many meditations <coughs> for at least 30 days because youtube thinks that my uh, account is spam because i'm because the reason why i uploaded all of these meditations was to hold you guys over and me while i was grieving my grandmother but youtube had a freak out um and so pretty much everything is on hold on my YouTube channel for 30 days. Um, <coughs> but I'm still able to make content. I'm still going to make videos. I'm still going to do my classes. And we'll just see what happens in 30 days. And I'm not going to worry about it because everything is fine. And this is all just practice. This is all just teaching me presence and gratitude and showing me that no matter, even if I can't see it, everything is working out in our favor. So um, the biggest thing I wanted to show up today for is to kind of let you guys know where I've been and again I do apologize if I number one it's been hard for me to talk as you can tell I'm like trying to hold back um but also um I haven't talked to hardly anybody for three months I've been very isolated uh really in hibernation mode for three months um it's been hard to sleep a lot of the time some days are great and some days are harder than others but i just want to let you guys know i'm here i will be i should be able to start going live every monday now um and then i'm going to be making other videos in the meantime i do appreciate you guys' support through all of this and still being here with me i promise it's going to be more focused on you guys and our lucid dreaming astral chats or whatever we want to talk about next monday um but this monday I just had enough energy <laughs> trying to talk to kind of let you guys know where I've been and kind of let you guys know what will be happening with the channel. And there's going to be a lot, a lot more content and a lot of things are going to be um, coming, especially with the, with the redirection that YouTube gave me. So we are going to be taking advantage of that. Um, what do you believe happens after death? Does astral projection give us an idea of where we'll go after this life? So, I believe that it does because when I died during my uh, hospital visit, like my overdose, it was, it, it was like the same place that I went to in an out-of-body experience, but it's all a thought-responsive state. And I also feel like that when you pass, you have to look at your entire life. Like, I really do believe that it's on like a review because my whole life flashed before my eyes too. Like, once I was in the hospital, like, I started seeing like from now all the way until I was baby, like born. So I was like going through this review of my life, but I think that it depends where you're called, um, maybe what you haven't completed or you need to complete, or you'll go wherever you, like, I don't believe in heaven and in hell, but I believe that we will go wherever our heaven is, like what that looks like for us individually. So my, my, heaven or the place that I like to chill is going to be way different than yours. Um, 
I do believe that we all literally have our own realities and universes in our brain. And the same thing, it's the same for when we pass away. I think that we all discover something different depending on who we are, what we've done, what we need to accomplish, or where we want to go. Or what we believe will happen. I believe that's a huge thing. What we believe to happen when we cross is what really does happen for us because we create our own universes and our own reality. Um, Jason, I love and miss you guys too. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I do have someone coming over soon, so I do gotta head off, but I just want to let you guys know, like, I will be able to respond to more of your chats and stuff next Monday. Like, it will be more focused on you guys. I'm in a ton of pain today. It was, like, really hard to even, um, come on today. Uh, and I don't, know what the pain actually is. There's been a few different things going on, but anyway, I'm scheduling to go somewhere to make sure that everything's fine, but it's been a lot. A lot has happened the past three months, so I'm sorry if I'm all over the place. Maybe I shouldn't be sorry because that's just where I'm at and that's okay too, um, <laughs> but just know that the content will be resuming. There won't be as many meditations, but if you guys would like to support me still, please continue to listen to the meditations that I have made. I worked super hard on those. I have like hundreds of like uh, over 200 I think meditations on my channel and I may have to delete some of those because YouTube thinks that um, some of the YouTube or the meditation videos on my channel are spam. Um, and so in 30 days ish I'll have to go back and try to delete some of my videos I'm gonna just try to delete like the last seven days of meditations to see if that helps or whatever um but I'm just trying to figure that out but if you guys want to support me obviously continue to listen to my meditations if that feels good to you and continue to show up and hang out with me because I really miss you guys and I will be hosting more classes I will be doing like the dream circles there's gonna be so many different ways to work with me and connect with me and I am also going to be focusing a lot more on one-on-one -on -one, uh, work so even if you want a session with me if you want to work with me for 30 days I have all the way up to a year program Yep, whether it is your lucid dreaming and astral travel coach, whether it is your life and business coach, or whether it is your YouTube growth coach. I do all of those from one single session all the way up to a year. Um, and there's tons of amazing things included in that and tons of ways that we can connect and grow together. But if you guys have any questions on how we can work together, please let me know. Um, yeah, yeah, Jason. <laughs> yep, Every, the... Yeah, everything's on hold. I'll, I'll message you about it. Uh, I was going to message you about it yesterday, but I haven't got around to it, but I will. But pretty much YouTube is having things on hold until, until I figure out what's going on. But anyway, um, can't remember where I left off on that, um, but I will see you guys for sure. Um, on Monday and again like if you guys have any questions on how you can work with me um, definitely let me know even if you're not a one-on-one -on -one kind of person I do have courses I do have master classes um, and I am going to be putting Haley's lucidity school on teachable so if you're not a member of my YouTube then you'll be able to buy the uh, lucidity school classes on their own on my teachable uh, I'm not even sure if my I think my memberships are on hold as well I think pretty much everything is on hold right now um, so your support really means a lot to me <laughs> thank you for showing up it really does mean a lot I can't do much with my YouTube channel for like 30 days like I can still upload content and stuff but a lot of the perks are on hold um, so you just showing up really means a lot <laughs> Thank you guys. Also, please feel free to join our Telegram group. That is like the chat for the community. I really want to grow that because I, it's easier for me to be present and update you guys in there because it's like super easy to open the app and just like chat with you guys in there. So definitely head over there if you have any questions or anything or for the community. And then I also have that Facebook group as well. Um, yeah, and I don't think you guys can buy merch on my YouTube right now. So if you want to purchase any merch to support me or anything, or donate to the channel, whatever, uh, then you can find all the links in the description as usual. So you won't see my store on my YouTube channel probably, but you'll still be able to go to the actual website and order to support me. Um, 
actually is Telegram on Google Play Store. Uh, yeah, it is because I also have Play Store, so. Yep. Um, and then the link also, Eric, I think if you click the link in my description, it will take you to the app immediately. Um, or you can try clicking that after you download, but there should be a Telegram uh, link in the description as well. Um, but I will be live next or this upcoming Monday uh, between 5 to 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I was a little behind today because of how I was feeling, um, but I really miss you guys. I really do need to chat with you guys. I've definitely, like, I haven't done much with dream work, uh, and I haven't really talked to anybody because it's been, like, so mentally and emotionally exhausting lately, but I'd love to connect with you guys, so yay, Eric! So definitely feel free to download that, and if I'm late or anything, I, I'll update you in Telegram, so you'll actually get, like, live updates on what's going on, uh, through Telegram if I'm late to a live, or, like, upcoming content, or whatever, um, or if I want your guys' like feedback or something for the channel, then it will be in Telegram. So I will see you next Monday. Please feel free to join that if you'd like to chat in the meantime. Again, I'm also available through Messenger. If you have any questions on how we can work together or anything at all, just let me know. I love you guys. I'll be able to read more of your chats next time and be able to chat with you guys a little bit more. But I love you. Thank you so much for joining. And can't wait to see you guys again. Sending you guys endless love and endless lucidity, and thank you for being here with me.